Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. And I don't know about you, but I've already been in the presence of the Lord here this morning. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to ask you to turn with me to another one of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter number 5. And just hold your spot there for a moment or two. There have been uh, two major contributing factors uh, in the development of my leadership over the course of these uh, 40 plus years. Um, One was uh, somebody gave me a copy of John Maxwell's book a number of years ago. Uh, It's out of print now or it's under a new title called Be a People Person. Uh, had a major impact on my life, changed me, uh, really just forever. And then um, a number of years ago, uh, the personnel committee um, gave me some information about uh, American Management Association having a meeting in New York City. Maurice and I went to that meeting, and uh, we spent an entire week there uh, learning how to manage conflict. I believe it was probably um, the best course that I've ever taken in my life. Um, You understand, as long as we live, uh, we're going to be facing conflict. And the problem is that most people don't know how to manage conflict. You you didn't learn it at home, uh, without a doubt. Most people never take a course in it or a lesson in it. You 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 don't ever have... So when, when we began to have multiple staff. It became an invaluable resource for me. Uh, and, and, and because nobody learns that stuff, you kind of grow into becoming one of two different people. One is what you would call an avoider. And, and one of the things that we do when we add staff is that we always give them a, a temperament analysis profile before we bring them on staff. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the factors that jumps out at us from time to time about the trait of a person, it'll have this statement in it, will avoid conflict at all cost. Uh, so you wind up, if you don't know how to manage conflict, you wind up being an avoider or you wind up being an appeaser. In other words, uh, Clay, it's kind of just, uh, we go along to get along. Okay, I'll never agree with you about something. There'll always be a little rift in between us, but we'll just ignore that, and, and I want to get along with you. So I, I become just an appeaser in the process. And, and neither one of those things are acceptable uh, if you're going to be a God pleaser. So I want you to watch with me now in verse number nine, chapter five. Uh, <clears throat> the Bible says, blessed are the, what's the next word? peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Here's a great statement. Uh, One of the real proofs that you're a child of God is that you are a peacemaker. Uh, It's one of those uh, stamps on our life. Do you know that across the world right now, uh, there are 40 international conflicts. Uh, there, uh, by the way, that 40 doesn't count our southern border. It doesn't count the political landscape of our nation. It doesn't uh, I- include the war on drugs that claims 60,000 people uh, in this country every year. It, it doesn't include the religious strife that we're facing, nor the 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 racial tension in our country. It doesn't include those. Would you agree with me, given uh, where we are in this world of ours, that this world needs more peacemakers? Would you say amen? amen? We need more peacemakers. Well, let me just ask you, what about in your life? And what about in your home? I've been working on this message for uh, about three weeks now and there are three reasons uh, that I want to preach the message this morning out of this beatitude. Uh, First of all, uh, conflict uh, and broken relationships 
really breaks my fellowship with God. I, hang on to that. Um, you can't be wrong with people and still be right with God. Let that sink in for a little bit. If you don't believe me, go read 1 John 4 and just study it out and let God's Holy Spirit speak to you through that word because you cannot be uh, messed up in your horizontal relationships and have a right vertical relationship. It does not work that way. So it breaks my fellowship with God. Second, I'm preaching it uh, because conflict with other people and broken relationships hinder my prayer life. You do understand that the connection with us is directly related to our connection with God. Uh, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 7 that you husbands, uh, you need to really be considerate of your wives and treat them with respect so that your prayers would not be hindered. Uh, so if you have broken relationships, if you're messed up horizontally, uh, your prayer life is going to be clogged up. The third reason uh, that I'm preaching this message today is because uh, if I am uh, not right with my fellow man, then it bars me from uh, happiness. Do you know that you can have all of the money in the world and you can have all of the success that anybody could ever achieve down here in this world, uh, but if you are not right in your relationships, you're never going to be happy. Uh, you, you can be on the beach of Aruba uh, in the uh, what, infinity pool uh, with beautiful weather and great people around you. You, you can be uh, on a cruise ship in the inside passage going up to Alaska. But, but let's, let me tell you, if you're not right with each other, not going to make a bit of difference in your happiness. You can have all of that stuff going on, but if you're wrong with somebody else, you're never going to be happy. Uh, the Bible tells us in, in James chapter 3 and verse 18, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest in righteousness. L let me just say this to everybody, and I'm going to finish up the message with a similar statement. Uh, being a peacemaker is a requirement by the Lord if we're going to live a happy life. Um, now then, so let me take a few minutes here and uh, I want to give you the ingredients uh, that go into becoming a peacemaker. How, how, how do you go about doing that? I hope you've got a pen and paper or something. They all begin with an I to kind of help you remember. Uh, so here we go. Uh, the first letter is the word initiate, initiate. Now, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, um, if you're going to heal broken relationships, if you're going to be a peacemaker, uh, God's word gives us the instructions that we're to be the one to make the first move. You, you don't sit back and wait on somebody to come to you to make the relationship right. God's word's very clear that you are to be the initiator. Did, did you... Did, Words are so very, very important. Did you see the word in, in, in verse number nine? He says that you and I are to be a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper. So we're, we're to initiate this. Uh, now hold on to your seats uh, because I, I'm gonna blow some of you out of the water here and I don't mean to, but uh, uh, it, it, it's just so very important that you understand uh, God says that being a peacemaker is even more important than you being here today in worship. You say, how do you know that? Well, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 23 and 24 says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift Thank God. L leave your gift <laughs> there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Now, my first church 
was 15 miles away uh, from where I lived. And uh, we had two very small children, uh, two years old and four years old, uh, when uh, uh, we pastored our first church. And uh, I don't know why in the world my wife uh, couldn't get up in time to feed our breakfast and get the kids ready and dress and get to the car at the same time that I did. And I'd, I'd, I'd sit in the carport and I'd blow the horn. That, that went over real well, let me tell you. Every, every Sunday, it was just fight, 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 tension, 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 argue, argue, argue. Every, and here I'm going to go preach about how to have a happy home. And, and I can't tell you the numbers of times in the two and a half years that I was pastoring in that church, how many times that I had to pull Kathy off into a room, in a Sunday school room somewhere before church and beg her forgiveness. Because I knew there wouldn't be any point in me getting behind the pulpit when my relationship with the woman that I loved and loved me wasn't what it needed to be. And God just said, you got to go uh, make that Right. There are some of you that are sitting here uh, this morning and many of you uh, that are watching across the world today uh, through the internet. You've been holding on to unresolved relationships for maybe weeks or months and some of you could have been holding on to this unresolved conflict for many years. You don't really realize how much it's hurting you spiritually. By the way, let me just help you with something. It's only going to get worse. I heard somebody say uh, not long ago, uh, well, preacher, you know, uh, time heals all wounds. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You go to the doctor and you get diagnosed with cancer and and he asks you what you want to do about it. Well, I'm just going to go sit out here in the waiting room for about two or three years. It's going to get better. No. That cancer is just going to get worse. And the same is true in our broken relationships. And the only way that it can ever be resolved is for you to take the initiative and face up to it. And handle it and deal with it. And I'm begging you in the name of Jesus, don't let fear rob you of the spiritual blessing that is coming your way when you simply do what God tells you to do about it. All right, you ready for number two? Here we go. Implore God for his wisdom. Implore God for his wisdom. I'm I'm just... uh, I'm I'm just in tune with God enough to believe that his word is still true. And and James 1 and 5 is still intact. And maybe you don't know how to resolve conflict. Maybe you don't know how to fix a broken relationship. But I know one who does. And God's word says that if you lack any kind of wisdom in being able to handle that kind of thing, he says all you've got to do is ask me. I will not withhold it from you but I will give it to you and I will give it to you lavishly. I I believe that to be true. So you go to God and you say, now God, uh, I don't want my life to be in this broken mess that it's in right now. And and I understand God that uh, I don't have what it takes to make this happen, but I know that you do. And so God, I want you to give me the wherewithal to make this right. Open up the door for me to be able to do this. Make sure that I do it in the right time, in the right way. And give me the words that I'll be able to say to make this right. And so after you have uh, decided you're going to do something about it, and after you've decided that the only way you can do something about it is with the help of the Lord, then the third thing you do, and I, 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 I dare say this may be the most difficult And it's what I I say is the introspection. The introspection. 99.999% of the problem may be because of somebody else. But before you go and confront the other person, step back a little bit and really decide what part you played in the brokenness. 
Uh, what should I have done? What could I have done? Uh, what was my part uh, that I played in this? Here's what God's word says. Before you go get that speck of sawdust out of somebody else's eye, make, make sure you get the beam out of your own eye. So you got to sit back and, and you got to look at that thing. Here's something that I, I, I really, um, I know this about me and I suspect, I'm, I know this about every child of God. If you're filled with Jesus, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there's really not much. It takes a whole lot to mess you up. Are y'all tracking with me right now? I mean, it takes a whole lot to get me bent out of shape when I'm full of Jesus. But when I'm full of pride and when I'm full of self and selfishness, man, I'm going to tell you, it doesn't take much at all to flare me up. Is that true about you? And, and, and here, so the real source of the problem is not all of those people that you consider to be a jerk but really what's going on inside you. James 4 and verse 1 says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Now, I don't do much marriage counseling anymore, uh, but I'm going to tell you one of the words that just triggered me. Uh, well, preacher, we, we just, uh, we, we're just incompatible. We're just incompatible. Well, baloney. We're all incompatible. That's just a bunch of junk. You have to make a choice somewhere along the way that you're going to love your spouse. You, you have to make a choice that you're going to love somebody else. My wife and I, I promise you, are about as opposite as you possibly can get but I have learned so much about life itself from her that it's unbelievable. Incompatible is, is a very poor uh, excuse. Let me, I don't know where I got this. I don't know where it came from really, uh, but it's a great statement and, and I quote, it is always more rewarding to resolve a conflict than to dissolve a relationship. You understand something about incompatibility? That's a bunch of junk. Let me just tell you what it really is. It's a matter of maturity. So in the name of Jesus, stop being a selfish, immature, irritating little, and you fill in the blank. So, so, so really what we're talking about here. Uh, is pride. And in Proverbs 13, 10, write it down, mark it down, read it. Proverbs 13, 10, pride leads to arguments. Hey, hey, look at me a minute. Look this way just a minute. Everybody in the building. I want you to think with me for just a minute about some broken relationship that you have in your life and, and who that might be. And, and, and possibly some of you have been in this log jam in this relationship for a very long time. I want to tell you this morning how to break that log jam. You go to that person that you've had this broken fellowship with for a while and you simply say to them, you know, I'm sorry. I was only thinking of myself. Now, men, when your wife wakes up from fainting right there, just tell her again, I'm sorry. I was only thinking of myself. She'll faint again. When she wakes up again, just tell her. Pride. Um, now, the reason you say that kind of phrase is because... Um, there, there's a fact here that we all possess weaknesses in our life and, and, and weaknesses are visible to us. We know what our weaknesses are. Amen? I mean, we know what our weaknesses are. But the problem is many of us have blind spots that can't be seen. Your weaknesses can be seen. Your blind spots, uh, they, they're usually not seen 
by the person. Do you remember um, the Bible tells us over there in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 3, and Jesus is giving us that analogy, and, and, he's, and he's describing to us about how to mend these broken relationships, and he says, hey guys, um, before you go get that sawdust out of that, that speck of sawdust out of somebody else's, uh, maybe you need to be aware of the telephone pole that is in your own eye. Um, powerful word from the Lord. Uh, talking about blind spots. Let me give you number four. Um, I use the word interpret here. Um, James 1 and 19, listen to this. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. How, how many times in the last 37 years as your pastor uh, have you heard me talk about that God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason? And, and he says, you, you need to be twice as quick to listen to somebody. In other words, once you go and seek to make it right with somebody else, don't go in there with all of the solutions and with all of the answers. The first thing that you want to do is that you want to get their perspective on what the real problem is. You, you want to get a handle on how they view things. And you want to listen to the hurt of that person's life. You, how many times have you heard me say and heard others say, hurt people hurt people? And so they've been hurt. Uh, by, the, by the way, um, it, it's real important that you find out what that hurt is. Because if you'll just stop and listen to somebody as they describe their hurt to you, they're going to come to the awareness, you know, he's listening to my side of this thing. Obviously, he cares about me or she cares about me. Because she is paying attention or he is paying attention. Always listen before you speak. It will speed up the reconciliation uh, by listening. The, the Word of God says in Philippians 2, he says, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now, there, there, there's a word in there when it says look to, it's the word where we uh, get our word microscope and telescope from. In other words, uh, if you're viewing from that perspective, you're going to see things that you would have never been able to see uh, with the naked eye. And so uh, here, here the, the, the writer says, if you want to be like Jesus and you want to see things that you have never seen or hear things that you've never, then pay attention to the interest of somebody else rather than just yourself. So, so you listen to them. You know, some of you are going to go to work tomorrow, and when I even say that, somebody's face abs just jumps out at you, and, and, and every time you even think of their name or see their face in your mind's eye, your blood begins to boil because you, you just have a major rift with that person. You know, maybe it's because you haven't sat down and just let them share their heart with you for a little bit. You want to interpret. Now, let, let me give you number five. You want to inject truth uh, with love. Ephesians 4, 15 says, speak the truth in love. H how many of you have had somebody come up to you? Well, I just tell it like it is. You ever heard that phrase? May I say to you, if, that, if that's maybe a motto of your life, don't be proud of that. That really just makes you a jerk. Um, and you don't care about people. And, and, and you just want to really just get something off your chest. It's one thing to speak the truth, but it's an entirely different thing to speak the truth uh, from a heart of love. We ought to be speaking the truth, but we ought never to be offensive with it. We ought to speak the truth, but we ought never to be defensive uh, with it. Let me just give you an example. Your kids mess up and you scream to the top of your lungs at your kids 
I'm going to tell you something. And and everything that may be coming out of your mouth may be the truth. But I'm going to tell you, when you start screaming and yelling and acting stupid, uh, your your kids are going to shut you down and they're not going to hear what you say. And the only thing that they're going to remember is how you said it and the anger and the emotion that came from you. A whole lot more. Now, (laughs) truth should never be used as a club to beat over the head with somebody else. You you may go to a restaurant and and the service may be horrible. Listen, if you're going to address it, address it in love. Don't be ugly about it. Don't use that as a club against the waitress or the clerk, if you will. You understand that that's never going to change anything. Uh, the only thing that's going to change is when you would take the truth and you wrap that word, you wrap those uh, with uh, love. Let, let, me, let me give you a prime example. What in the world has been accomplished in Seattle, Washington? What in the world has been uh, accomplished in Portland, Oregon with the riots and with the looting and with the burning and with the stealing and with the violence? Absolutely nothing. Get out in the streets. Uh, it, 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 let, me, let, me, let me just put it like this. If I were to get over here on the street corner and I were to take the Bible and I would wave it around and I'd scream to the top of my voice, turn or burn, repent or go to hell. Is that true? How many people's lives do you ever think are going to be changed because of that? There are trigger words in your marriage too, and you know what they are. You wives that are sitting here, you, you know those trigger words that he pulls out from time to time that just sets you off. And you men that are here, you husbands, you know those trigger words that your wives use and every time that it comes out of their mouth, boy, it just fires you up. Can I encourage you Married couples here, take those words off the table. Just remove them. Let me tell you what else to take off the table. Take off the threat of divorce and lock it up and throw away the key and just simply come to the place in your marriage when you says, that's not an option for us. We're going to make this work. So let me give you number six. It's the word illuminate. You say, how many of these do you have? I have 42, so just hang on. So so what what do you mean illuminate? Um, Pretty simple. Turn the bright lights on the problem, not on the blame. You know, you can blame anybody or anything, but it'll never fix anything. Want me to prove that to you? Take a little trip to Washington, D.C. That's about all we got going on right now is blaming. And the reason that we're in this shape is because of this group. And the reason we're in this shape is because of this group. If I had this group to cooperate with this group, and if I could do it's because of this. And it's because, nothing in the world but a bunch of blame going on. And guess what? Hasn't fixed anything. Same thing through with relationships. You got any problems in your life? Is there sex problems in your marriage? Are there finance problems in your home? Do you have a scheduling problem with the kids? Do you have problems with the children? Get the focus off the blame and put it on the problem. Colossians 3 says, rid yourself of Filthy language and anger and rage and malice and slander from your lips. Focus on the problem, not the person. Let me give you number seven. Intently focus on reconciliation, not resolution. Um, Intently focus on reconciliation, not resolution. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible says, 
All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he was committed to us the message, and he has committed unto us the message of reconciliation. Uh, you say, what do you mean? Uh, focus on reconciliation, not resolution. What, 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 why not resolution? Well, resolution means that you and I agree together. And if you've been married for five minutes, you know that you're not going to agree about everything. I, I don't have a relationship in my life whereby I agree with that person about everything. We're just going to disagree about some things in this life. But you can disagree without being disagreeable. You know what that's called? It's called spiritual maturity. It's called wisdom. It's called Christ-likeness. Kathy and I don't agree about everything. Never have. I'm going to tell you, we've walked hand in hand for 50 years. Now, here's the deal. When we have focused on our relationship, then the issues that we're confronting seem to be really insignificant. We've had major blow-ups over some of the silliest things that you could ever imagine. Don't look at me so spiritual. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You've been there. Just dumb stuff. And when we focus in on the issues, the relationship suffers but when you focus on the relationship, you see how insignificant the stuff you're arguing about really is. Okay, winding down. According to what we just read in 2 Corinthians, according to what we just read in Matthew chapter 5, if you really are a Christ follower you will be in the ministry of reconciliation. You will be a peacemaker. Guys, we're living in a messed up world, a world that is filled with prejudice and racism, and violence and terrorism and people getting in each other's faces and attacking each other. We're living in a world of broken relationships and broken marriages and broken hearts. God's word, and, and I'm challenging you with God's word today. Be a bridge builder. Be a peacemaker. Be a witness. Go say to a broken world, God's not mad at you. God loves you. God's done everything that he possibly can do to bring you into a right relationship with him by paying your sin debt. On Calvary's cross. Let's be peacemakers. Would you stand with me and let's bow for just a moment, please? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Those of you that are at home or watching with some device, would you join us in this invitation? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. How many of you would genuinely and honestly right now um, say, Pastor, uh, there is a person in my life that I'm just really not right with. It, it, it's something that I know is broken and I, I've just let it go. And, and I know the relationship's not what it ought to be. And I'm going to ask the Lord right where I'm standing to give me the wisdom and the wherewithal to make this relationship right. 
Would you hold your hand up good and high for just a minute? Hands going up, popping up everywhere, all over the building, all over the building, all over the building. Over here on my right, would you just lift your hand over here? Just lift it up. So right now where you're standing, would you just simply say, Lord, um, I'm not right with, and put the name right there. My relationship with, put the name right there, is not pleasing to you. And Holy Spirit, with your help, I'm going to reach out to make this right. Give me the wisdom that I need to do it in a manner that would please you. I pray that they'll be receptive and our relationship could be reconciled. I wonder, maybe there's somebody here this morning that your relationship to God's not what it ought to be. And right where you are, you're just going to make the determination, you know, God, um, I'm not where I need to be with you. Would you just pray that with me right where you're standing or right in the confines of your home? God, my relationship with you is not what it ought to be. I've let sin... Rob me of my fellowship with you. Father, would you please forgive me and restore me to a right relationship today. Thank you for forgiving me of my sin. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.